First of all, namaskar and uh, really very good morning. I'm really honored to be here at uh, IIT Madras in this uh, August gallery. Really, I really feel uh, privileged when I received the invitation from IIT Madras to speak. A topic which really has touched my heart. Why it has touched my heart, I'm going to speak also here. That is one part of my talk. Second part uh, is the small modular reactor. Almost five years or so, uh, probably I was the only person in atomic energy which was working behind the scene before it came to the notice of Niti Aayog. So there is another story behind that. Third and most important is, I don't know how many students are here. They are the really flag bearers of this nation. We are the setting sun, and they are the rising sun, most important. How energy is relevant, how you are relevant. If you are not relevant, I bet it on this stage, your children will not survive. And why? That answer is also here. So with this uh, brief uh, introduction, let me again thank uh, IIT Madras to invite me again to speak uh, here. So the title of my talk here is uh, Relevance of Small Modular Reactors for a Decarbon Energy Sector. We have been hearing probably, I was not here, very unfortunate, but for the last three days you must be hearing energy, energy, energy that all clean energy. Believe it or not, energy is the health of a nation. Those nations which are energy rich, they are only rich and vice versa. So, while that was one of the objectives of India, especially after independence, to accelerate the energy growth, there is something happened in the last few years on the carbon aspect. There was everywhere talking about that we have to reduce the carbon footprint and there is relevance of the green energy, clean energy and that way the nuclear energy. And you may not be knowing about 20 years back or 15 years back, I used to write many policy papers in India on the energy. Why? thinking that by end of this century, coal, oil, and gas are going to be exhausted. And we need all this green, clean energy. Nobody had expected that by 2020, we have to stop them, even though they are plentifully available. And that is why, probably the last three days, we are, you, all of us may be breaking their heads that how relevant is clean energy, green energy, how much time we have to deploy it and deploy in an accelerated manner. So, briefly I want to speak out how much is today the total primary energy supply of India. It's, uh, you'll not believe it's a huge number, close to 900 million tons of oil equivalent. We are almost the third largest supplier in the, also the consumer in the world. But if you look at the fragmentation of them, a large fraction of them comes from coal, oil, gas, and also biomass. Large fraction. It's not only we, the globally also is similar. And the renewables and others are really very, very small. The health depends on here. How much is the import versus what nature has given us. If you look at coal, two-thirds we have. Still as on today, we import one-third. Oil, one-third we have, import two-third. Bioenergy, almost we have, and natural gas is almost 50-50. And this is why I said the health of the nation depends on what we have and how much we import. Even though we are the third largest producer, consumers of the energy, if you look at the top right axis, we are the third largest consumer after China and the United States. Because we have a huge population, our per capita energy consumption is very, very low. 1,200 kilowatt hour per year per person. And if you just compare with our neighbors, which include Thailand, China, Malaysia, 
we still are very, very low, almost one third of uh, that of Thailand, and world average also three times more than us. OECD countries almost close to six to seven times more than us. And as what is reflected every, every time we speak or show this graph that our per capita energy consumption is low. And that is why somehow it is also indirectly visible or directly visible to our human development index as compared to the developed nations. So there is a big effort to go towards that. But if you look at the India, that's for you people. How much energy really we are hungry for? As on today, believe it or not, in India, almost 10 crore people don't have access to electricity. And believe it or not, almost 84 crore people don't have access to clean cooking fuels. Of course, it's well known that, well, you must have seen the previous presentations. There is a strong rise in electricity growth from 169 gigawatt to almost 377 gigawatt in the last 10 years, primarily because driven by our GDP growth, which is one of the largest in the world. That's why the energy sector has grown. But very difficult or very, very something over it for us, our population is rising. Today, we are 1.42 billion, I think one of the large, second largest in the world. Another 30 crore people are waiting to join us. How much? 30 crore people are waiting to join us in the next 20 years. So we'll be close to 1.67 billion people, surprising that of China. And this population will require huge amount of energy. And it is like that it will cause another 25% of energy demand by 2040. And to meet this energy demand, what is projected will require a power size of European Union, what is there today. GDP of India is expected to continue at 8.5% between 2012 and 2047. And this will also will be reflected in the urbanization. Today it is 31% as going to grows to something like 51% by mid of this century. And this will, all this will cause huge amount of energy demand in manufacturing sector as well as in other sectors. Most important for us, if we want to be developed, or tomorrow it will be seen, if we look at the United States, Europe, large fraction of people have already gone in a flight. But in India, much, or I will say that several, Several, several millions of people have never sat in a flight. They were ambitious to go in a plane. If you look at how many Indians own a car, very, very small population. You look at Europe, America, or Japan, almost everyone has few cars. So all these are going to drag energy, energy, and energy in future. Very simple way. There are a large fraction of Indians today don't own air conditioner or refrigerators. Only in cities, very few people own. So they will be also desiring to have them in future. How much energy we require? If I ask this question, nobody has answered by mid of this century how much energy we'll be requiring. I've just plotted the graph here from 2005 to almost 2020. Total energy consumption of India, it looks like a very straight line. It has gone just below 5,000 terawatt hour, I think around 2005, and today we are just below 10,000 terawatt hour per year. Almost straight line, linearly it has climbed. And if I just extend it in the same straight line, by mid of the century, it's around 20,000 terawatt hour per year. Almost it will double. This I see as a business as usual model. The top one is the population, which is also growing to reach something like 1.7 billion population by mid of the century. When I plot this bottom graph, many think tanks are worried that we cannot have HDI of that of the European or the American. We need to have an exponential energy growth, should have, so that we are one of the developed nations in the world. Of course, there is nothing wrong in ambition, being ambitious. 
So by mid of this century, it's projected that we should have something like 50,000 terawatt hour per year. This is the total amount of energy that we consume, which includes the domestic electricity supply also. The biggest worry. Even with present 10,000 terawatt hour per year, already the bell has rang. The bell has rang with regard to the greenhouse gas emissions and is all because of the carbon-based oxides, nitrous oxides, methane and all, which are produced because of burning of the carbon-based sources. And this is something you see, share of energy sources in global in electricity generation today. I'm not talking about only India. If you look at today itself, the coal, oil, and gas still almost more close to seven, more than 70% of the total energy consumption. And that is why the greenhouse gases, especially the carbon CO2 emissions, it has climbed from something like below 40 gigaton CO2 per year. Today, it's almost 60 gigaton CO2 per year, almost. Today, this number, please remember, today globally, we are emitting almost equivalent to 60 gigaton CO2 per year. This number you please remember. This you can tell your children, family members also. And uh, how this CO2 is very, very relevant. This has come from many studies. Most important came from the Nobel Prize winner, the Japanese professor Shukuro Manabe. Last year he got the Nobel Prize 2021 for his predictions in 1967 using very simple model that if those CO2 concentration in the atmosphere rises by two times, the Earth's temperature is going to rise by 2.36 degrees Celsius and vice versa. You take away the CO2 by two times, the temperature is going to fall by 2.28 degrees Celsius. Okay, so this number, please remember, this you can tell to your friends, to everyone. If the CO2 concentration rises by two times, the ambient temperature is going to rise by two degrees Celsius or vice versa. This is the result of the his uh, very detailed studies he did in 1967, but it's very difficult. There is no time to speak about it. That why it took so long for scientists to realize what he predicted in 67 is correct today. And how much is the CO2 concentration today? If you look at the pre-industrial level and today it has almost climbed by 50%. So, it's well predicted that the Earth's temperature has gone higher by close to 0.8 to 1 degree Celsius limit. It has already crossed. And I say, today we emit 60 gigaton CO2 per year. How much is permissible? If these predictions are correct by IPCC, International Panel for Climate Change, if we want to limit the Earth's temperature below 1.5 degree Celsius, the total budget of CO2 is only 400 to 500 gigatons. How much? 400 to 500 gigatons. How much we are emitting per year? 60, as on today. But it keep on rising. That means next 10 years, we will be reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius. If we want to limit 2 degrees Celsius, the budget is only 1150 to 1350 gigatons of CO2. That means the next 20 years, before mid of the century, if we today don't give the break, we'll be crossing the two degrees Celsius limit. Okay? So time for you is only two to three decades left. Don't imagine that by end of the century, I'll do it. That time is over for all of us. What is the CO2 targets by International Energy Agency and MIT study? Today, believe it or not, to produce one unit of electricity, how much United States emit the carbon dioxide? It's almost half a kg. China, more than half a kg. United Kingdom, 350 grams. France, because large fraction of electricity they produce from nuclear is almost 90 grams CO2 per, per one unit of electricity. What International Energy Agency advocates? If you want to limit two degrees Celsius limit, all these have to be limited below 10 grams. That means one unit of electricity you are permitted to emit below 10 grams of CO2. 
But the MIT study says this is not sufficient if you want to decarbonize the whole energy sector. You have to go for a deep decarbonization. This limit has to be only one gram. One unit means only one gram CO2. That's all. If you can read the MIT report, very nicely they have analyzed, analyzed this study. Look at what Indian, uh, sorry, International Energy Agency recommends for India if you want to achieve the net zero. It's very, very, this is where the health of the nation is reflected. The first bullet says you have to reduce CO2 in net zero by compensating with low carbon hydrogen. How much you require? 520 million tons of low carbon hydrogen. You just calculate what is the cost of that. If you want to produce 520 million tons of low carbon hydrogen by mid of this century per year, how much money you require? 85% buildings have to be zero carbon. 70% electricity globally have to be from solar, PV, and wind. Renewables should contribute almost 90% of electricity generation. 90% heavy industry have to consume low carbon energy and almost close to 80 gigaton of CO2 have to be captured. If I, I think I don't want to speak it away, all of you will be very scared. If I have to calculate the amount of money required to accomplish this, it's much more than what India is having the total wealth today. It's such a big difficulty. If I don't want, the other option is that I keep on burning coal, oil, and gas. What is predicted for India? that if no action is taken to mitigate climate risks, we will be losing something like 7.14 lakhs crores of rupees per year against flood, against uh, the climatic changes, drought, and so on. And the Standard Chartered Bank says that this is too less. We will be losing something like 22 lakhs crores of rupees because of the also in addition to what we do we're also losing a lot of export. And together, it is something like 22 lakhs crores which we're losing. And if you take action today, it's something like 3 lakhs crore we gain. So something like, if you add this to 25 lakhs crore of rupees we'll be saving per year. Now, this is my title, The Energy Dilemma. How much carbon-free electricity production possible for India? Forget about this dream, 20,000 by 2050 or 50,000 terawatt by 2050. How much it is possible for India? Have we ever calculated the scene? This is something I want to show in the next few slides. What is the maximum energy potential from renewables for India? It is all from MNRE. Niti Aayog's report, I have put it. MNRE says solar potential of the country is around 1640 terawatt hour per year. Niti Aayog says it can be some order of 2040 terawatt hour per year. Professor Sukhadme assumed three numbers, 5, 10, 15% of barrel and uncultivated land of India. And he predicts something like 1095 to close to 3000 terawatt hour per year. And what something like, I assumed something like taking 10% of the land, barren and uncultivated land, and also storage technology fully deployed, which is not there today, and no plant outage, no losses, then max to max what we gain is only 2,000 terawatt hour per year from solar. Wind, I think there are a lot of discussions, sorry I missed that. The MNRI says, now, they're talking about much bigger mast height, 100 meter mast height, smart grid storage in place, almost another 1,000 terawatt hour per year. Hydro, the potential is 788, bio 60, all together only gives you 4,000 terawatt hour per year. And how much you require as on today? 10,000 terawatt hour per year. What is the balance? It's 6,000 terawatt hour per year. It's a huge balance, 6,000 terawatt hour per year to decarbonize today's energy demand. Forget about 2050, 20,000, 50,000 and so on. And if I take an energy system having very high plant load factor like nuclear, 
this requires something like 750 to 800 gigawatt electric. How much? 750 to 800 gigawatt electric. Please remember these numbers. Can nuclear energy provide this solution? This is a question. Because we have a deficit of almost 6,000 terawatt hour per year for today. I'm not dreaming about tomorrow. Let us look at why nuclear energy is very relevant. The amount of energy produced, uh, suppose we build a 100 megawatt plant, which operates 24 hours, that gives me 2,400 theoretically this much energy, 2,400 megawatt hour. Nuclear, very high plant load factor, it gives as in today, 2,167, coal 1,531, Natural gas 1020, hydroelectric 955, concentric solar 792, wind 480, solar PV is very, very low uh, uh, capacity factor, almost 360 to 450. So, this much energy I can sell for a day. And uh, the most important is how much CO2 is emitted if you want to build this type of energy systems. Coal, as you know, close to one, uh, one unit will produce something like 820 grams of CO2, and followed by biomass 740, natural gas 490, uh, biomass co-firing, sorry, only biomass 230, solar PV 48, solar PV roof 41, geothermal 38, Solar concentrated 27, hydropower 20, 12, nuclear is 12, wind is 12, and wind offshore is 11. This is roughly what is predicted. So suppose you want to meet the IEA standards or recommendation that one gram of, sorry, one unit of electricity, you require roughly around 11, let us say, grams of CO2 which is permitted. What is left with you is only nuclear, wind, and wind. And so up, so. And uh, how much CO2 has been saved? Cumulative low carbon electricity generation. In advanced countries, if you look at, during 1971 to 2018, nuclear is something like 8,000 terawatt hour. This has the operation. Hydro is the next renewable, which is in operation, is something like uh, close to 60,000 terawatt hour per year. Solar and other renewables are really very small because there is not much operational experience. And cumulatively, how much CO2 has been avoided so far? If you look at by the year 2018, almost because of this nuclear power, almost 60 gigaton of CO2 has been eliminated because of their uh, grid nature. Now, here itself, the story I'm building of most important for India, if we want to decarbonize the energy sector, the coal plants, which are drivers for the electricity today, they are going to retire. They have to be retired. And uh, in my estimation, that uh, the life of a coal plant today is roughly 30 years. And if government doesn't give them any permission for extension, in the next, uh, I would say by mid of this century, almost uh, 200 gigawatt electric coal plant will be off the grid. How much? 200 gigawatt electric, which is because of which we are getting electricity, will be off the grid by mid of this century. And uh, what we thought, can we replace these coal plants by nuclear? That was one part. United States, very recently they have projected that in United States, they have surveyed almost 400 coal sites and they have found that nearly 250 gigawatt nuclear can be built. This is a very recent study in the retiring coal plants. And today itself, according to the CA, Central Electric Authority projection, almost 10 gigawatt electric coal is off the grid, mostly belonging to state governments. Those who have retired, there is no more, I'll say that, to replace them by coal itself. Except the NTPC plants, they're replacing the old plants by new plants, state governments, private companies, they are not doing so. Where the coal plants are located? Coal plants are located in those regions 
where the coal is available. Okay, wherever the coal mines are available. So mostly in the central region of India, a large fraction in the central, I'd say that eastern part, and very few are west, north, south are very, very few. And if you look at the seismic zones, where these coal plants are located, mostly they are in zone two, and very few are in zone three. And if you want to build a nuclear plant in a vacated coal site, the most important is the seismic conditions. So seismic zone two, three, and up to four, they favor to replace the coal plant by nuclear. So a big question for all of us, what can replace this 220 gigawatt electric coal if it is going to be retired very progressively, already started retiring by mid of this century, can we do it by nuclear? Today, what we are producing from nuclear is very small, totally is about 6,780 megawatt or 7 gigawatt, you can say, which include the Russian two imported uh, reactors that is at Kudankulam, they produce 2,000 megawatt. And there is a very big plan that by mid of the century, we'll be building more 43 units more. And together by, two, sorry, by 2031, 43 more units will be constructed. They'll be adding something like 22 gigawatt and the 23 more units also are under planning. Together, what is projected that by mid of this century, almost 66 units will be operational, and the target is 50 gigawatt electric. And if I convert to terawatt hour per year, is only 400 terawatt hour per year, okay? And how much I said the deficit? 6,000, after I take out, take in all renewables, Still, I have a deficit of 6,000 terawatt per year. With a big struggle, if I accomplish this also, you'll say this is not required. 400 out of 6,000, negligibly small. So it's not required. Why you are struggling to get accomplished this? So this is why even if this is achieved, this is very, very small. What is the problem? Why nuclear power is unable to expand? One of our own problem is our population density. We are a small land. Today we are 1.4 billion population. Another 30 years, 1.7 billion population. If you look at the population density, we are the largest in the world. That is one of the problems. And to build a conventional nuclear power plant, because of the safety issue, we have to put first one kilometer radius exclusion zone where nobody should live. Another 16 kilometer long zone, which is an emergency planning zone. That in case of emergency, public has to be evacuated, okay? So very, very minimum population is allowed to live here. Another is called the sterilized zone, which is still bigger, it's almost 30 kilometer radius. So to get, to build one plant, you need all these criteria, okay? So you don't get so much land. In India, you don't have the luxury to build such large conventional power plants. Second issue is project cost. If you build one, like in Kudankulam, 1,000 megawatt electric plant, today it costs something like 30,000 crore. One plant costs 30,000 crore. And you invest today, it takes 10 years to construct. That means you start returning, those who are engineers can understand you invest today 30,000 crore, you have to wait 10 years to start getting the return. And there is a big problem, is because a lot of civil works is involved, supply chain delays, and that is why these large size reactors are not getting popularity. Safety issues, even though they are very excellent, the history of nuclear reactors, there are only three accidents has happened, believe it or not, I had a, uh, another one hour talk, but I don't have time to speak here. Because of radiation, in all these three accidents, not a single fellow has died, or he has got cancer. So all these misnomers are removed. But still, because of the public concern, they have been put more and more safety systems in the design, like core catcher, hydrogen mitigation systems, venting systems, all these cost 
and also complexity to the design of the plan. And most important, to satisfy no emergency planning in public domain. Because if I want to build a reactor in Madras city, all of you will be very scared, putting a flag that, no, we don't need nuclear. Because there is an emergency planning in public domain in case of any accident. This is another issue with the current design. Let's, uh, so let's look at the small modular reactor. Can it find some solution? What is the SMR? SMR is basically small size reactor. Power is less than 300 megawatt electric, even smaller than that. And they're targeted to produce large amount of low carbon energy, not only for electricity, but also for like cold countries, district heating, hydrogen production, drinking water, that is through desalination, and also for defense applications, even electricity supply to remote locations. So there are plenty of objectives for which these reactors have been designed for. Small, because it's small with regard to the power. Modular, because each component here can be manufactured in a factory, in a single factory, and assembled like a product. For example, you are buying a refrigerator, you don't have to buy the compressor somewhere, the conditioner somewhere, everything comes as a single box, and you just plug and play. So this is called the modularity of this reactor. A reactor you all know, where the fission axons. So small is not new. If you look historically, the generation one type reactors were basically small reactors. With time, the size kept on increasing. Why? If the size is more, the economics helps. So that is why today, anything below 1,000 megawatt electric size is not told to be economically competitive. Look at the technology of these small modular reactors. If I want to classify them, they are classified in two types. One is near-term deployment, another is a long-term deployment. Because in the world today, almost 70 plus designs are going on. So I have just classified them into two categories, which can be deployed immediately, not after 15 years, according to this slogan here. Another is a long-term deployment, I understand. This is 2050 and beyond. The water-cooled reactors are targeted for near-term deployment because this mature technology. For the last 60 years, this technology is operational. Manufacturing technologies are well proven. The industry experience last 60 years exists. Regulation method licensing criteria exists. Design life safety well proven, understood. On the other hand, the new technologies like high temperature reactors, including molten salt reactors, they're considered to be far phased ones. They may be operational by 2040 and 50. In the water cool technology, there are two variants. One is the block type reactors, another is the integral reactors. In the block type reactors, this is the reactor pressure vessel, which houses the nuclear fuel, and all the components like the steam generator, the pumps, they are directly welded to the vessels, okay? Like neck to neck welding. There are no pipes, but they are directly welded into this. In the case of integral SMRs or small modular reactors, the steam generator pump, everything is housed inside the pressure vessel. So it's like a refrigerator you are buying from the market. So the reactor itself houses the nuclear fuel, the steam generator, pump, everything inside a single pressure vessel. So this can be manufactured in a factory and shipped to the site for direct installation. And uh, which are the reactors readily deployable today? One is the American new scale reactor. The Karam is Argentinian reactor, the Chinese SCP-100, Korean Smart. All four of them have been already licensed. New scale almost is licensed by United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Argentina is uh, almost towards commissioning. China is in advanced stage of construction of this SCP-100. Koreans have licensed the smart. They want to join with the UAE for joint uh, deployment of this smart reactor. And if you look at their power of these reactors, it's something like 77, 30, 125, 100, except the Argentinian one, 
which is a technology demonstrator, almost all are commercially deployable reactors. And the power range is around 100 megawatt electric or 300 megawatt thermal. And the pressure temperature conditions have been kept similar to operating pressurized water reactors. And these reactors have been designed with the extensive passive systems in place to cater to all accident conditions. I will be showing later on some of the slides how they take care. And unlike the conventional reactors where concrete containment is there, these reactors use metal containment. And in case of accident, this metallic containment basically removes all the heat through air itself because small reactor, small heat, so air itself can take out the heat by natural convection. So because of this, the emergency planning zone is not claimed in any of these designs. That means these reactors are targeted to be built close to a city like Chennai, for example. How this safety is accomplished so that no emergency planning zone requirement is required. Here the size of the reactor is small. I said 100 megawatt as compared to large size reactor, 1000 megawatt. The radioactive inventory is small, is a proportionate. Release at plant boundary never exceeds one number. That's called 10 millisievert. If the dose is about 10 millisievert, then only I have to take action in the public. Otherwise, no action is required. So by design, it is proven that it never exceeds this dose limit under any circumstances of the reactor. Even the operator can leave the reactor site in case of an accident. He can go to his house, take care of his family. So that is why it is called walk away safe reactor. The operator can just forgive, forget there is a reactor, there is some accident happened. Looking at the Indian thing, the technology of these passive systems we have developed in the last 30 years, especially while we were designing the advanced heavy water reactor, so there is a lot of lessons from that. So this can be directly, I will say that leveraged in this SMR without much investment or delay in the research. This is what I was telling. This look at is a conventional reactor, for example, the Kulon Kulon plant. You have a reactor pressure vessel, the steam generator, the pressurizer, pumps, everything is outside and they're connected through very big pipes. In case of SMR, this is my reactor, which houses all my components inside. And this reactor I can build in a factory, like in a Larson and Timber factory or Godrej factory and put on a truck and put in a retired coal plant directly. So this we name as a product. This is not reactor anymore. This is called as a product, single product. Economic advantage, most important. Small reactor, 100 megawatt, it may cost 2,000 crores as compared to 20,000 crore of a large reactor. So because the investment is small, and in two to three years we directly get the start getting the returns, many small investors are interested. Because 20,000 crore, if I wait 10 years to get return, I'm afraid, and only big investors will go. So small investors, they would like to invest in this, and early returns because in two to three years, you connect to the grid. And that is because most of the components are built in factory, so interest during construction is very, very small as compared to large size reactors. And there is a lot of study, what is the cost of electricity of SMRs as compared to large size reactors, the most important is when you talk about those SMRs, we are talking about large volume, not one or two units. We are talking about thousands of these reactors to be built, like millions of refrigerators you are buying, millions of air conditioners you are buying. So here we are talking about thousands of these reactors going to come. So multiple units, learning curve, construction schedule is very small. All these things people look at, the cost today According to a US study, the levelized cost of electricity for four units of 150 megawatt is around five rupees 30 paisa in Indian rupees for the first unit, and for the eighth number of units below five rupees per unit. It's very, very attractive. Most important for India is making India large employment generation. Because today, 
the industry is ready to build this type of reactors. This we have explored. The Indian manufacturing industry today can force, this is a limitation of Indian manufacturing industry, totally in got around 210 tons and uh, a complete product almost 60 tons. So maximum outer diameter is 5.2 meter of a vessel. And after forging, what we give almost 3.8 meter OD and 3.4 meter ID with the thickness of a reactor pressure vessel of that design pressure temperature. And if you look at this weight of this vessel, it's below 500 tons. It is possible to uh, transport this reactor by Indian road condition from factory to the place. And removal of decay heat is possible that I'll show by uh, basically uh, through passive means which can eliminate the core melt accident and minimum site work here. This is the most important to eliminate the emergency planning zone, how a small modular reactor qualifies. Exclusion zone criteria, criteria for exclusion zone today is one millisievert per year. I understand there is a warning, but I will take another 10 minutes. Yeah? I, have, I have spent 30,000 rupees for government of India coming by business class to give this talk. So please allow me to speak another 10 minutes. Don't give me warning, okay? So exclusion zone, today is one millisievert per year at plant boundary during normal operation. Considering the current actual, even any size of reactor today is possible to meet this dose limit of one millisievert per year. Emergency planning zone, suppose I don't want. The dose limit, as I said, is 10 millisievert. And what United States has done, very, very intelligently, they have found the size of the reactor is 250 megawatt thermal, which comes to electricity around 77 megawatt electric. That is same as the new scale design. If I want to put a reactor in the public domain, the size of the reactor is 250 megawatt thermal, or around 100 megawatt electric. That's why all the countries in the world, they're talking about electrical a power rating of almost 100 megawatt for SMR. The limiting size of Indian SMR, that's why we have limited to around 100 megawatt electric, considering no emergency planning is required in public domain. This is how the right side will look like the reactor vessel. This is the inner part here, you see the, uh, the fuel, which is here, very similar to the Kuran Coulomb fuel. At the top, which is long controller drive mechanisms. At the top, the uh, pressurizer is located. The steam generator has nothing but the helical coil steam generator. It's not the conventional steam generator, YouTube type. It comes like a helical coil steam generator, which is wrapped around in, the, in this gap. So, and there are no pumps in the system. It operates by thermal siphon system. Yeah. And the secondary side uh, steam is produced at uh, uh, superheated steam, goes to turbine for production of electricity. The fuel is very close to that of the Kulon Kulon plant, with you thinking that tomorrow, suppose India has the possibility of getting the technology of Kulon Kulon for localization, the same technology can be used here for fabrication of the fuel for this type of reactors. This is the steel containment which it is having. It's a very, very wonderful, very compact containment. The bottom is housed inside this vessel directly in the containment. It's very close to one. At top is a wider range of containment. So bottom is around six meter, top is around eight meter. Unlike a large, a large size reactor, the containment is around 70 to 80 meter diameter. Here the containment size is only six to eight meters, okay? And it is a steel containment, so in case of accident, it can be cooled by air itself. You don't have to really bother about to remove any decay heat here. Here I'll tell you, suppose there is a Fukushima type accident, how it removes the heat. So here, in case of Fukushima type accident, here itself, we don't have pumps. The primary side circulation is taking place by natural circulation. The heat is, will be going to an air-cooled condenser here. So the heat from the primary side goes through a dedicated steam generator or a heat exchanger, which is cooled by air for about indefinite period. So the heating of the core 
never goes to any, any allowable limit. And uh, this is the, again, the 3D view of this reactor. There's the containment, there are support. Uh, this, yeah, this is the top view of this reactor. Huh, the most important. If I put four of these reactors, the layout shows around 250 meter by 250 meter. So in a size of 250 by 250 meter, I can put four into 100, that is 400 megawatt. And they can be put with either with the four independent turbines, or two can be connected to two turbines, or four can be connected to a single turbine, depending on the application. Then here it's a very important study. What we uh, did through satellite mapping, we try to put how many SMRs can be located in a coal size plants. This study was done in conjunction with NIAS uh, Bangalore. So, this plant, NTPC has uh, requested me not to tell the name of this plant, a typical 3,760 megawatt thermal power station occupies almost 10 kilometers square without ash pond, 23 kilometers square with ash pond. If you look at the area required, it's almost one acre per megawatt electric without ash pond. Nuclear power plant, if you look at our two into 530 megawatt electric, they occupy only 0.8 kilometer square area, which includes the reactor building, turbine building, something like 0.1 acre per, 0.2 acres per megawatt electric. And if you consider the exclusion zone of one kilometer, still it is only 0.686 acres per megawatt. So if this land, 23 kilometer square, is utilized for solar, government can think, I don't want nuclear, I want to give it to solar, how much power we can reduce? In place of a 3,700 megawatt, max to max we can get 720 megawatt. If this land can be utilized for wind, it's much, still much smaller, only 568 megawatt electric. Now we try to put the SMRs in this place, okay? While obeying the one kilometer exclusion zone, what we found that a 32 numbers of SMRs can be put here, and they can produce something like 3,200 megawatt in place of uh, 3,760 megawatt, which is operational. Now, the balance area in the exclusion zone, there's a big area available. We thought, let us put the, in the balance area, as well as in the aspen area, the solar PV. And that will give additional 730. So together, solar nuclear produces 3,930 megawatt as compared to 3,760. Then I will be showing many plants. Talcher, Odisha, this thermal power plant has already retired and they were producing 460 megawatt. When you try to put the SMRs, we found the same land without doing anything. We can produce 600 megawatt. Another place is called the Tokla Beda village. And here also we started doing the same thing. So this is the NTPC site. And the third plant was the Guru Govind Roper Thermal Power Station. Today it produces 1,260 megawatt. What we found is a huge land available, and we can put something like 36 into 400 plus 2 into 200 SMRs. Together they can produce 14,800 megawatt. So we thought this can be our SMR park one. Faraka another place. Today it produces 2,100 megawatt. If we put SMRs, it can produce 2,000 megawatt. Even in India, believe it or not, almost 30% of electricity is consumed by cattle power plants. For those, especially for high, I would say that, uh, uh, like steel, aluminum, these heavy industries, they consume almost 30% electricity. What we did, we visited one of the Nalco plants where the aluminum is produced. And today, uh, they operate with 1,200 megawatt, 10 number of small size coal-based plants are there to produce electricity, 10 into 120. So we mapped this whole area. And what we found, the existing domain itself is 3 into 400, 1,200 megawatt can be produced. Or there is some unoccupied land also, we told them. Together, it can produce almost double the power. In fact, the authorities were so happy, so happy that if this can be replaced by 
nuclear. Why? Because they're not getting coal. All the coal is taken by NTPC. They're not giving the coal. Second thing that the pollution board is always touching their neck. That stop it, stop it, and stop it. Third is very interesting, the Upur Thermal Power Project. Initially, it was Tamil Nadu government had sanctioned 1,600 megawatt coal-based thermal power plant. But because it's located in a bad region, so the cost of electricity was projected to be very high because coal has to be transported all the way from Odisha, Bihar, and all. So then this area was totally unoccupied until now. It's a green site. So we mapped this whole area. We found SMR Park 2. Today, we, in place of 1,200 megawatt, we can produce 12,800 megawatt in the same site. Then we uh, looked at Kothagudam uh, uh, for installing the SMRs. Here also we found 13 modules producing 5,200 megawatt can be done. Then Badarapur thermal power project, five modules, 2,000 megawatt can be produced. Similarly, Kota, Rajasthan, existing 1,240 SMRs can produce 3,200 megawatt. Sanjay Gandhi thermal power station, existing 1,340, it can be uh, replaced by 2,000 megawatt SMRs. Similarly, uh, this is uh, Manuguru. Manuguru is the place, is again the uh, captive power plant to produce uh, heavy water. So they consume huge, uh, I think, a lot of electricity. But these coal plants also have retired. What we found in this place, we can easily put 2,000 megawatt uh, SMRs. The saving factors by choosing existing coal sites for SMRs is land acquisition, most important. As I said, we are small land, huge population. Getting land is next to impossible. So the land is already there. The coal plants are available. So this time, money, efforts are saved. Water bodies, all coal plants, they remove also more than 60% of energy to water body. So this is also available. Site survey, done. Transport facility, well connected. Rail, road, everything is connected to that. Decommissioning of boiler, turbine, this many plants is already done. Some where it is not done can be used for SMRs. Trend manpower, most important for India, when 220 gigawatt electric coal plants will be retiring, what will happen to the people who are working there? It's a very big question mark. Today, believe it or not, the largest employment is from the energy sector. When coal, oil, and gas are going to be stopped, Unless these equivalent industries come up in India, it will be a really bad situation for India. So what we thought that most of the people who are working in this thermal power can be redeployed here. Township already existing, sewage treatment plant, so huge saving is envisaged here. And this is last one or two slides before I complete. We made a survey. There's nothing I have done. It's from literature. Today, so what is the electricity cost? Supercritical coal is 5 rupees 46 paisa. Moment we go for carbon capture and storage, which is the forcing by the IPCC, the cost is almost double, 11 rupees 16 paisa. Natural gas, 2 rupees 78 paisa. Moment we go for CCS, the cost is very high, 8 rupees 48 paisa. Solar PV, one of the lowest, 2 rupees 47 paisa. Moment we go for battery storage is 11 rupees 47 paisa. Wind, 2 rupees 30 paisa. Moment we go for battery storage, the cost is almost similar to solar PV. Nuclear, even a 700 megawatt turbine, a yes, plant today, as on today, it is 5 rupees 20 paisa. There's a lot of scope for nuclear exist. And this is, uh, this is not only for India, this is from the United States. What is the projected cost? of electricity by technology-wise by 2040. This is from a US study. The new plants, nuclear, if you see, it's something like 80, or I'll say that, uh, close to $100 per megawatt hour. And if you go for extension of the life, because most of the nuclear power plants, even though designed for 40 years, they get extension up to 60 years. First 10 years, then another 10 years. 
the cost is reduced by almost half. Solar PV, solar PV storage, the prices are coming to be higher than nuclear with life extension. Wind and wind onshore, offshore, and coal, and with storage, yes, sorry, carbon capture. If you look at the nuclear is quite competitive to other energy technologies with lifetime extension. Most important for SMR, this curve will go down because the cost for electricity in SMR is quite competitive to that of other technologies. Very important for us is the green hydrogen production. Why? Because few years from now, almost all along, I'll say that traveling vehicles, industries, they will be requiring for hydrogen. I spoke one number, 500 million tons of hydrogen is required. Where you will get so much so green hydrogen? And one way is definitely electrolysis. If you go for low temperature electrolysis, for megawatt electric, we can get something like 480 kg of hydrogen. If you go high temperature electrolysis, it's almost 630 kg. So where the SMRs will play a major role, wherever there is no electricity demand, they can be dedicated for hydrogen production. Next is, this is the, my last but one slide, most important for India, believe it or not. Rain God gives same amount of water, whether we are 1950 or we will be at 2050. 1950, Rain God used to serve us 361, uh, sorry, uh, 5177 meter cube per year because our population was small. And the amount of water was the same. Our population has increased very exponentially. As a result of which, the per capita water availability has exponentially gone down. And when you reach 1140, then the UN body classifies we are water scarce or highly water stressed. We'll be classified to that. And it's not much time. It's only 30 years from now. And for that, I believe SMRs have played a major role for desalination.